Our scripture reading this evening will be from the Gospel of John chapter 5. John chapter 5. Be reading from the English Standard Version this evening. John chapter 5, beginning in verse 39. You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life and it is that they bear witness about me. Yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. I do not receive glory from people. But I know that you do not have the love of God within you. I have come in my Father's name and you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, you will receive him. How can you believe whenever you receive glory from one another and do not seek the glory that comes from the only God. Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one who accuses you, Moses, on whom you have set your hope. For if you believed Moses, you would have believed me, for he wrote of me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? There was a time whenever men believed that the shape of the earth was flat. There was a time whenever the world believed that the whole universe revolved around the world, revolved around the earth. We've progressed since then, right? We understand that the earth is round. We understand that it is not all of our Milky Way that revolves around the earth. Actually, God and his wisdom chose for the galaxy to revolve around the sun. And yet there are still people who believe that the entire universe revolves around them. (laughs) You know people like that? Were you once one at one time yourself? Where you thought everything that happened was happening to you? Where if there was a conversation, it was you that you liked to talk about? Or if there was things that transpired, it was uh, interpreted by how is this going to affect me and mine. Isn't it nice within the religious world that there are not such men within leadership positions? I mean, that's, there's just not anyone who is in the position of the leader of a church or a group that is supposed to be religious that just loves the spotlight who seems to be one that loves the applause, who always wants everyone's mind's eye to be upon them. Whenever they enter the room, they expect everybody's focus to be upon them. Now, we would call that, I I think if we were being nice, we would call that being self-centered. If we were talking about it and categorizing it within the spiritual walk, we would say that that is self-righteous. Someone who believes that everything that transpires has to go through me, right? I determine. I decide. Now, we have seen men throughout the course of the history of our own nation and in other places as well command such authority from their followers and it be detrimental to them. By their fruits, you shall know them. It's not so much is God on our side as are we on God's side, as what we emphasized this morning. The title of my lesson for this evening is God-Centered Religion. And I purposely had our reading shortened. Uh, If you notice where we were right there in John chapter 5, beginning in verse 39 until the end of the chapter, there's a lot of red ink that is within that portion. And you look at that and you can see that Jesus has been talking for a while. And who is it that he has been talking to? Well, if you read it within the context, you know that he has been addressing the religious leaders of the day. And what has he said to them in particular? Look again at verse 44. How can you believe whenever you receive glory from one another and do not seek the glory that comes only from God? In Jesus' time, amongst God's people, there had arisen a generation of leaders who loved the praises of men, who sought glory from one another, 
And Jesus said in direct contrast, in, in contradiction to the glory of God. And because of this attitude of being the center of their own little universe and believing that they know better than anyone else, they are actually refusing to believe in the Son of God having come in the flesh. Now, in the context, if you start at about verse 25 and you read through, what Jesus lists are five witnesses to the Son of God. How many witnesses did it take in order to condemn somebody within the Old Testament? Just two, right? Or three. At the testimony of two or three, one could be condemned to death. If you don't have at least two, then you can't be uh, held accountable for what is allegedly that they did. But just two or three witnesses. The Hebrew writer brings this out as well in Hebrews chapter 10. And so what is Jesus doing whenever he says, I have five witnesses? And if you are starting reading there in verse 25, you can see as you go down that he says that John has testified about me. John who? John the Baptist. He was the forerunner of Christ. He goes on to say, the miracles that I have done testify of me. The Father bears witness that I am he. And then where we were starting in our reading in verse 39, the scriptures proclaim that I am the Son of God. And then even Moses will stand on the last day and he will condemn you because you have not accepted that I am the Son of God. Now, remember within our study, those of you who are here on Sunday morning in our auditorium class where we looked at the Hebrew writer saying of the gospel, how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation that was first declared to us by the Lord, then heard by those or believed upon by those who heard, God himself performing signs and miracles, and then finally through the testimony of the Holy Spirit with the with the signs. Well, it sounds like these writers of the scriptures just have witnesses on the brain, don't they? And they do because what they are doing is solidifying the truth just as sure as one would stand before a court of law and testify to the whole truth and nothing but the truth. So help me God, these writers are saying that you can have confidence in what I say because what I give you is testified to by God himself. And if you look at both of those passages of scripture, these passages that we looked at, you will find the father and the Son, and the Holy Spirit as witnesses of being that which God has revealed. About what? What is so important that God has gotten involved, namely, with Christ Jesus, his Son, and with the gospel message. Now, what we are going to do this evening is we're going to look at a passage within the Old Testament, and then we're going to come back and we're going to look at a couple within the New. But what we are going to establish is that though the mystery of Christ was held from the mind of man until whenever God was satisfied that man was ready, which was at the death, the burial, the resurrection of Christ and his ascension into heaven and then the descension of the Holy Spirit upon those apostles on the day of Pentecost. Though the mystery of Christ was somewhat withheld from man, so much so that we even have discussed, right, that the prophets and the angels themselves long to know what it was that they were being ministers of. God was giving these little hints all throughout scriptures, allowing these windows of opportunity for man to have a small inkling as to there is something great on the horizon. Something is going to transpire. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 9, Paul says, What eye has not seen, what ear has not heard, and what heart has not imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. And all of those things are something now that have been revealed in Jesus Christ. Those things in the first Corinthians chapter two and verse nine passage have been revealed in Christ. Evidences of God's plan fulfilled, imparted, and then made manifest. God's creation declares that he is, right? All things that he made declare the creator's glory. God works all things, even his creation, to the good of you and I, a testimony and evidence. And what I want us to understand is that God has revealed himself in such detail that man cannot be in the dark whenever it comes to walking in the light. Jesus said, the scriptures, meaning the Old Testament scriptures, have testified or have talked about me. And he's talking to these Jewish leaders and he is saying, you trust in the scriptures. You think that within them you have life. 
Well, if you really understood the scriptures, then you would know that they were talking about me. But because you have mistrusted, because you have misunderstood or misinterpreted what the scriptures are saying, you are about to walk in darkness for all eternity. Even Moses talked about me. Would you like to know where that passage is? If you like to write in your Bibles, this is one of those passages that I think is pretty important that you could write in the margins of your Bible in John chapter 5 in referencing where Moses says this, and it's in Deuteronomy chapter 18 and verse 15, if you'd like to put that within your margins. If you have your Bibles open, go to that passage. Remember I said God's gospel was a mystery. He gave little windows of opportunity. Listen to what Moses says, and Jesus says this directly proves that their leader, Moses, their Jewish leader understood that God would send a prophet likened to him. Beginning in verse 15 of Deuteronomy chapter 18. The Lord your God will rise up for you a prophet like me from amongst you, from your brothers. It is to him you shall listen. Just as you desired of the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly, whenever you said, let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God or, or see his great fire anymore lest I die. And the Lord said to me, they are right in what they have spoken. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from amongst their brothers and I will put my words in his mouth and he shall speak to them all that I command him and whoever will not listen to my words that he shall speak in my name I myself will require it of him now we're going to keep reading in just a moment the rest of that but what was God prophesying through Moses and by the way how many years is this prior to the time of Christ coming this is Deuteronomy when did Moses live in relationship to Christ? When is this little window being given to the people? They have this great prophet, this man of God who has received the law. He has stood before them. God has impressed his power upon them through this man, through the, uh, also the mountains quaking, through the lightning and the thunder, through Moses' face itself glowing whenever he was in God's presence and the people saying, oh, you be the one to talk to God. We don't want to be the one to talk to God. And God says that they are, have spoken rightly and someday I will talk to them through someone else and he will come from the Jewish people and he will reveal my word. How many years is that prior to? 1500 centuries, right? Or uh, 1500 years, 15 centuries approximately before Christ comes. And God said, when this prophet comes, what kind of things is he going to talk about? What kind of sermons is he going to give? Whose word and whose authority is he going to have? And what Moses reveals is whenever he comes, he is going to speak what he has been commanded by God. Now remember, the title of our lesson for this evening is God-Centered Religion. So oftentimes, man wants to place himself as the authority and the voice. I mean, because after all, we are so wise, I mean, who can... You know, debunk that, right, ladies? We, man is just so right. And we like to stand before and pontificate on the things that we have discerned, that we believe, that we have come to know. I mean, because after all, our experiences have developed the wisdom that we have, and it is from God? Well, let me ask you, if that is the case, why did God come to earth? Why did God have to send his son? Why does Jesus himself say, I have only given that which I have heard from the Father? If I was testifying of myself, then my testimony would be true. But I have given you that which God told me to give you. What I heard, I spoke. Now, you and I both know that Jesus is more than just a good man. That he's more than just a rabbi. Jesus is more than a prophet. That Jesus is the Son of God. And so it's a little bit hard for us to discern and say, now, wait a minute, he is God, but he is saying that he is only obeying or saying those things that God had given him to say, well, yes, and that's exactly right. Because look now, go back with me. We'll go back to John in just a minute. But look at verse 19. Read as we continue. As God has said just uh, about this man that he will come, my words will be within his mouth, verse 19. And whoever will not listen to my words that he shall speak in my name, I myself will require it of him. 
But the pro prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name that I have not commanded him to speak, or who speaks in the name of other gods, that same prophet shall die. Oh, God says 1,500 years before Christ appears. Christ confirms to those religious leaders of his day that his son, we know that uh, Moses wasn't revealed that, that it was the son of God, but that Jesus is that one that is speaking to them that Moses had said is going to come. And we're going to see Christ say that of himself in just a moment. But then God goes on to say there will be presumptuous men. He didn't say that there's going to be presumptuous women, but I, I'm sure that you're included in there as well. I'm sorry, gals, but there are going to be those that have heard the word of God and have failed to proclaim it. And in fact, they will presume to speak in the name of God whenever they have not heard. We don't have any of that within the religious world today either, right? Your religion, my religion, that which I have bound to my heart, because really that's all that religion means. You know, within the English, religion, re means again. Religion means to bind to one's heart, and that just means that whatever I have bound to my heart. Have I bound to my heart the words of God or the words of men? What is your religion? You can be a religious golfer, right? That doesn't mean that you're spiritual. That means that you have bound the game of golf to your heart and that's what is most important to you is that you are going to live for golf you can be a religious fisherman knitter sewer hunter there are all kinds of things that you can be religious at because that is simply composed of that which is i bound, bound to my heart it's not a spiritual component but god-centered religion is that which i have heard from god I believe it to be from him and I bind to my heart as truth as I walk in those things that he has revealed. God-centered. It's not, is God on my side? But am I on God's side? Because man can be deceived and even self-deceived. Man can believe something with all of his heart because of the experiences that he has had has taught him this. But if it's in direct contradiction to the scripture... What am I to do as a, as a listener? The Berean brethren were more noble than the Thessalonians, it said in the book of Acts, because they looked up daily those things that Paul was saying within the scripture to make sure that they were true. Do you do that with me? I hope that you do, because we can all be deceived. We only know truth in light of what God has revealed to us. What should happen to those who act presumptuously there in Deuteronomy? What should happen to the prophet that proclaims he speaks in the name of God, but in fact, he, God has not sent him? Moses has declared, there will come one after me. You best listen to him, or you're going to answer to God. Okay, picking back up now, as Jesus describes himself, a little bit earlier in John chapter 5. Go with me back to John chapter 5. And see what he says of himself with regards to what God has given him in verse 30. We're going to start. And this isn't even in the beginning of the, the context. But think of what God said. He will say that which I give him. Everything that I have commanded he will reveal. Listen to Jesus describe his own ministry. I can do nothing on my own. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just because I seek not my own will, but the will of him who sent me. If I alone bear witness about myself, my testimony is not true. There is another that bears witness about me, and I know that the testimony that he bears about me is true. What has Jesus said about his ministry? Yes, he has been sent by God, and he has been sent by God to deliver exactly what he has heard by way of command, and Jesus says that is what is going to judge. That will determine, that will vindicate and condemn, that will justify and punish those things that God has revealed. And Jesus himself says in John chapter 10 that I came, and I did not come to condemn the world but the word that I have spoken will judge the world. He said, I came not to judge the world, but the word that I have spoken will judge the world on the last day. John chapter 12 and verse 48. Is that not what Jesus is trying to convince these religious leaders of here? Wait a minute. 
You are no longer God-centered. You have not listened to John. You have not taken into account the miracles that I have performed. You have not listened to the Father. You are misinterpreting the scriptures. And in fact, you have not listened to Moses. And all of those are going to be witness against you. Now, if you had those five character witnesses on your side and you were able to say to the judge, well, now, judge, I've got these five and this one, this one is righteous, that would be a great thing to have, wouldn't it? Those five character witnesses on your side... But if those are against me, to have them against me on the day of judgment, is Jesus pulling any punches here? No. And what he is saying about you and about me is that our hearts need to have a God-centered religion. Ask yourself these questions. If the Bible says it, do I accept it? If it is written within the scriptures, do I obey it? And if, if it's there and it's clear then my faith should be founded upon that and that alone. The Hebrew writer says, without faith it is impossible to please God. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is the rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Think of those Pharisees that were standing there hearing Christ. They were setting him aside. The words that he was speaking were coming directly from God and they weren't listening. But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and he is the rewarder of them that diligently seek him. My faith is of no value if I am simply listening to presumptuous men. That prophet was worthy of death who claimed that he comes in the name of God, and yet he has not been within God's counsel because he is leading others astray. The Apostle Paul even commends those that are within the church at Berea who did not think simply because he was an apostle that they were going to build their faith upon him, but they searched the scriptures daily to see if those things that he was saying was true. You see, whenever I bind to my heart that which God has revealed, which Christ has heard and declared, when my faith is based upon the inspiration of the scriptures... All scripture is God-breathed and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be what? Perfectly and thoroughly furnished unto every good work. This presumptuous man, and pray this is never me, this presumptuous man who assumes that he knows better that he can add to, that he can take away, that he can declare within the name of God that which God has not revealed, that presumptuous man condemns himself and his hearers as well. But you can have confidence whenever you are looking into God's word and trusting that Jesus is the way. He said it himself. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. God-centered religion is Christ-centered. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, glory of the only begotten, full of grace and truth. Now, one of the things that I know whenever I study the Scripture is just how simple I am. I'm glad you didn't amen that one. One of the things that I realize as I study God's Word is you know, just how far from that measure, that standard, that I rise to. I am a creature of sin, and by the way, so are you. And if man says that he is without sin, then he is a liar, and the truth is not in him. And you say, boy, this is getting depressing pretty quick. No, we beheld his glory, glory of the only begotten, sent from the Father, full of grace and truth. Truth is going to reveal that I need a Savior. Truth will reveal that man should never presume to know better than God. Truth will reveal that God in his mercy has granted life to this chief of sinners through the blood of Christ, and that's true of God's grace. And that's why God waited, not just for 1,500 years from the time of Moses. Is Adam and Eve, what do we think, 4,000 years before the time of Christ, according to some? 6,000 years uh, before Christ, according to others? Let's just go with that larger number for now, for the sake of the argument. 6,000 years before the time of Christ. And God says to Eve, through your seed will come one whose heel will be bruised by Satan, by the serpent, but he will crush his head. Little mysteries being revealed thousands of years later because man was not ready for a savior. 
to understand blood sacrifice, to understand the mercy seat, to understand that God has come in the flesh, to appreciate the virgin birth, the sinless life, the calling of the apostles, the, the death upon the cross, and then him declared, of course, to be the Son of God through his resurrection, Romans chapter 1 and verse 4. But God deemed that that time was right. And now, for 2,000 years, the mystery has been revealed and it has been proclaimed. What eye has not seen, what ear has not heard, what heart could not imagine what God has prepared for those who love him. But you and I, we have available to us that which prophets, that which angels long to see and to hear. Here stands Christ giving unto them what God had commanded, sacrificing himself for you and for me, the only Son of God, the only Savior, the only message that provides the way, the truth, and the life. And why does man still presume? It's been well laid out. Is it arrogance? Is it ignorance? Well, who will you listen to? Who are you going to believe? God simply, I declared it before it would happen so that whenever it happens, you might believe. Declared to be the Son of God with power through the resurrection of the dead. Let's close with a passage from John chapter 12. We know that Christ and what he did for us by way of sacrifice, how he gave his life upon the cross, dying in our place. Listen to how Christ says what it is that his death represents, beginning in verse 23 of John chapter 12. And Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Whoever loves his life loses it. And whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, there will my servant be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. You know that seed has to decay before a crop can grow. That seed is so precious that it's kept within the sack or kept within the bin, and then it is sprayed with herbicides and, and pesticides. But it's not until it falls into the ground and dies and it almost seems counterintuitive, right, that it actually has to die before it can produce life. But we know the way that kernel holds the germ of life, that it's not until that plant actually dies, that seed dies, that that plant begins to grow. But whenever it grows, it produces. Jesus is forecasting his own death and he is saying yes I have come to earth to live in the flesh yes I have come to proclaim the good news yes I have come to choose my disciples but there is something that must transpire before my life is over and I must die and I must give my life and until that time that I am planted within the grave life for you is not possible but once it's there and then he alluded to something else that was there too right he says you must die he talked to his follower and he said, you must die to yourself. You can no longer live as the one who is in the spotlight, whom the world revolves around, who makes all of the decisions, who guides all of the ages. You have died to yourself because only then will you serve me and you will follow me. If any man would come after me, let him take up his cross daily and follow me. Only then is life truly possible when Jesus is the one that is bound to our heart. Then we have God-centered religion. Have you bound Jesus to your heart? He asks you to do so. He stands at the door knocking, waiting for you to put him on in baptism so that you might have eternal salvation, so that you might have the hope of eternal life with him, with the forgiveness of sins. If after having become baptized, you've strayed away, please come as we stand and as we sing.